Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, and I should perhaps add good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Adam Liff, and I'm joining you today from Indiana University, and I have the honor of serving as moderator for today's panel on work-life balance in the COVID age. On behalf of all of today's sponsors, it's a pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this, the first virtual Abe Fellows Global Forum, which is an initiative of the Abe Fellowship Program of the Social Science Research Council and the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. Abe Global is designed to share current and former Abe Fellows expertise on pressing issues of global concern and hosts events each year in partnership with academic and civic organizations. This year's forum is co-sponsored with New America's Better Life Lab, whose director is Bridges Schult, a former Abe Fellow and one of our panelists today, and the 21st Century Japan Politics and Society Initiative here at Indiana University's Hamilton Luger School, which is directed by me, also an alum of the Abe Fellowship Program. Now, this year's forum focuses on the profound challenges for work-life balance in the US and Japan, many of which have been thrown into sharp relief by COVID-19 and its hugely disruptive economic and societal effects. Early on, schools and child cares were closed in both countries, causing a crisis for millions of families, especially those with young children. Today, tens of millions of children remain out of school and are learning online with very mixed results and significant second and third order consequences that go far beyond simply whether they are able to learn effectively. Meanwhile, many parents and women in particular have struggled to meet both family and work obligations simultaneously. Many have lost their jobs or have been forced to reduce hours and pay to take care of their children and support their kids' education online. Meanwhile, in both countries, essential workers have faced impossible choices amidst immense uncertainty about the future course of the pandemic. All of these choices carry significant trade-offs and implications for individual and family members physical and mental health, education, social welfare, economic stability and opportunity, and the functioning of local and national economies. In short, beyond its devastating public health and economic consequences, COVID-19 has also exacerbated gaping inequalities in societies and brought into sharp relief work-life balance challenges around the world, including the US and Japan. Today's forum brings together three former Abe Fellows to discuss these pressing issues. In particular, this year's forum will review the gains made in the struggle for gender equality over the last decade and consider the challenges facing both Japan and the United States, as well as the differential impact of the pandemic as a result of differences in education, marital status, occupation, race, and other factors. Our speakers will address these issues and examine what needs to be done to ensure a work-life balance that allows both women and men to share the pleasures and responsibilities of a life that truly balances work and private life. The speakers will also share ideas for what Japan and the United States can learn from each other. Before I introduce our panelists, our hosts would like to share a two minute welcome message from Hiroko Tsuka, Executive Vice President of the Japan Foundation and Acting Executive Director of the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. Greetings from Tokyo, Japan. I'm Tsuka Hiroko, Executive Vice President of the Japan Foundation and Acting Executive Director of Center for Global Partnership, CGP. CGP was established within the Japan Foundation in 1991 to promote collaborations between the people of Japan, United States, and beyond in order to address issues of global concern. The Abe Fellowship Program is one of our flagship programs. This research fellowship program, jointly carried out by CGP and Social Science Research Council, SSRC, was created in 1991 and has supported over 440 Abe Fellows. It encourages international multidisciplinary research on topics of contemporary global concern and issues requiring urgent attention. Focusing on individual researchers, this program fosters the development of a new generation of researchers and journalists interested in researching policy-relevant topics of long-term importance, sharing their comparative research and becoming active members of a worldwide network of researchers and journalists 
focusing on contemporary policy issues. In order to bring the Abe Fellows' expansive research achievement to a broader audience, since 2017, we have been holding the Abe Fellows' Global Forum in the United States. This year, due to COVID-19, we are holding a virtual Abe Fellow Global Forum. And because it is online, more people in the US, Japan, and around the world can enjoy the event. I'm very excited about our first virtual Abe Fellow Global Forum, and I hope you will enjoy the presentation and discussion by the Abe Fellow. Thank you. Thank you, Tsukasan. Let me now introduce our three panelists, each of whom will provide roughly eight minutes of prepared remarks before we have a live discussion among the panelists and with you, the audience. So if you have a question for our panel, please send it in at any time using the Q&A button that you see at the bottom of your screen. Let me also note that today's session will be recorded and posted online for later viewing. So our first two presenters are joining us from Japan and will share their prepared remarks via a pre-recorded video before joining us for the live discussion which follows. Our third speaker will present live from Washington, DC. So our first speaker will be Setsuya Fukuda, who is a social demographer at the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research in Japan. Dr. Fukuda has also served in government as an expert at the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. He is a 2013 Abe Fellow and will be speaking about the legacy of womenomics in Japan and issues of gender equality and female employment in particular. Our second speaker will be Machiko Osawa, a labor economist at Japan Women's University, where she also directs the Research Institute for Women and Careers. Dr. Osawa has served on the advisory boards of various government ministries and bureaus and is the author of various books, including Women and Work in the 21st Century. She is a 1992 Abe Fellow and will be speaking about the pandemic's impact on gender, employment, and work-life balance in Japan. Our final speaker is Bridget Schultz, who directs the Better Life Lab and the Work Life, Gender Equality, and Social Policy Program at New America, a major think tank in Washington, D.C. Ms. Schultz is a journalist and best-selling author of a book on time pressure, gender, and modern life, aptly titled Overwhelmed, Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time. She is a 2017 Abe Fellow and will be speaking about issues of work family justice in the age of COVID-19 with a focus on the United States. After our three speakers give their prepared remarks, I will then moderate a live discussion with them for a few minutes before we open things up to our global audience. So let me now turn things over to Dr. Fukuda. Good morning. It is my honor to give a talk in this forum. Today, I'm going to talk about the legacy of Womenomics. Womenomics is a core concept set in the economic revival plan conducted by the Abe administration. Womenomics deals with not only economic growth, but also other issues relating to work-life balance. After Abe's longest administration ended, I think it is a good right moment to discuss about what has been done and what has not been done by womenomics in the sphere of gender equality. And here, in this rather short presentation, I focus on female employment and fertility. So first of all, I provide a brief introduction of womenomics. By definition, womenomics is a concept to capitalize the power of women in economic growth. It was first introduced to Japan in Casey Matsui and her colleagues report at Goldman Sachs in 1999. Womenomics was announced to be a vital component of Abenomics. The major motivation of Womenomics was on top of other things to counter Japan's labor force shortage caused by continuous decline in birth rate. The goal of Womenomics was by 2020 First, to rise the female employment rate to 73%. Second, to increase the share of women in leadership positions to 30%. One thing to note is women mix is combined with other policies to prevent low fertility by supporting working mothers and to promote women's empowerment and gender equality. 
actual policy plans in Remenomics came with three pillars. First, expanding support for child rearing and housework. Second, encouraging companies to promote women. Third, reforming tax and social security systems. The first set of policies are mainly to create more places for child care. Also, outsourcing of housework was initially included. The second set of policies involves with creating new laws to merit family-friendly companies, visualizing women's promotion at companies, and prohibiting long work hours and promoting telework, and so forth. And the third one is about reforming tax and social security systems so they are not based on the male breadwinner family model. As I mentioned, Women Mix is implemented with a set of family policy to support families to combine work and family. Here is a selected list of family policy in Japan. Just briefly, we have parental leave, which is one of the most generous benefits in the world. Although not much, we also do have child allowances for children under age 15. 80% of childcare is licensed and under government control in Japan. Licensed childcare publicly subsidizes 90% of the learning cost. Starting from October 2019, preschool tuition and daycare service fee for three to five year old children are largely subsidized. Also, high school tuition fees are for both public and private high schools are subsidized. And finally, the medical costs for children up until age 15 are free for most of the municipalities. So in general, the child rearing costs are greatly reduced for both single and dual earner families in Japan. Now I turn your attention to womenomics and gender situations in Japan. The graph on the left shows the extra number of women aged 20 to 64 who started working since Abe came to power. It shows a continuous rise, and by the end of the last year, we see over 2 million more women in this age is in the workforce. As a result, employment rate of women aged 25 to 44 achieved the policy goal of 73% in 2017. The graph in the middle shows the share of regular workers among uh, employees at age 25 to 44. The gender gap is still large. However, share of women working in regular employees increased from 51% to 55% during the period of women mix. The graph on the right shows the gender wage gap of full-time employees. Gender wage gap is still large in Japan compared with the US or other OECD countries, but it is on the continuous decline. The next graph on the left shows the share of women in managerial positions. The share of women in managerial and executive positions sharply increased during women mix, but these numbers are still very low compared with other advanced countries. And graph in the middle shows the percentage of parental leave uptake for eligible men and women. Women already have a quite high percentage of parental leave uptake, over 80%. However, for men, the percentage of parental leave uptake is quite low. However, it shows also the sharp increase during women mix. It reached the 7.5%. Uh, by the end of the last year. Graph on the right shows the total fertility rate. Women mix overlapped with the peak of fertility recovery. However, by the end of the period, fertility started to decline and now reached to 1.36, which is departing from the ideal TFR of 1.8. So as shown very briefly, there has been some progress, but the changes were so slow. Here I came up with some reasons of why. First, long work hours. Japan is known for its long work hour culture. A custom of long work hour makes women hesitant to take up responsible positions. 
also making it impossible for men to spend enough time with family. The second is a high share of non-standard workers. The share of non-standard workers consists of a major part of Japan's labor force, but non-standard workers are sometimes out of policy coverage, such as parental leave and public childcare. The third is the coexistence of old and new policies. If a spouse is earning less than a threshold income, that spouse can obtain the status of dependent spouse in tax and social security systems in Japan. Dependent spouse status entitles tax deduction, free basic pension, and employee health insurance, and even additional allowances from partner's employer. So these factors are contributing to rather slow change in Japan gender equality in labor force. Finally, I'd like to mention about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the legacy of womenomics. So as I mentioned, there has been some progress in womenomics, but this progress is in danger. Because female workers are more likely to lose their jobs than male workers. Also, the media report tells unequal domestic task sharing accelerated during stay home. Finally, the marriage and fertility are likely to further decline. One hope may be a rapid increase in the use of telework, which is possibly change the Japan's work life style, which was hindering the changes in gender equality in Japan. More will be discussed on this issue in the next talk by Machiko Osawa. Thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me for such an important symposium. My name is Machiko Osawa. I'm a labor economist. I've been working on gender issues in pers international perspective for quite some time. And today, I'd like to talk about the impact on COVID-19 pandemic on employment and work-life balance in Japan. The first slide, I show you the results of the survey conducted right before the emergency declaration was announced on the 7th of April. You can see the 38.4% of male workers and 50.2% of female workers responded that days of work as well as working hours were reduced. Moreover, 37.5% of men and 42.7% of women workers experienced income loss. It is quite interesting that more women than men experience the negative impact due to COVID-19. This is because Japan's service sector has been hit hard by the pandemic, and there are more women in this sector, and many are non-legal workers. Restaurants, hotels, tourism, transport, real estate, and retail industries rely heavily on female non-legal workers. As these have contracted, they have reduced contingent staff and cut their hours. 61% of female part-time workers responded that their hours of work were cut and reduced, while 67% of single mothers answered either they have already experienced income loss or expected to do so, according to the survey by NPO supporting single parents in Osaka. Please look at the slide too. This slide shows the growth of female non-regular workers in Japan since 1984. In 1984, only 30% of working women were employed as non-regular workers, while in 2019, 56 of them are non-regular workers. The pandemic has hit women hardest because they have been marginalized into jobs where they enjoy little job security. 
Most recent labor statistics shows that the job openings to applicant ratio dropped sharply, and the overall number of non-regular workers were reduced by 1.3 million. In April, the government reported that seven, 700,000 women dropped out of the labor force. Prime Minister's office abrupt school closure in early March that left parents scrambling to make childcare arrangements. Long working hours and low productivity are long-standing concerns of the Japanese government. In order to address this problem, the government encourages corporations to expand teleworking, but only 6% of the working population was teleworking prior to the outbreak. This figure increased to 25% following the emergency declaration, but receded to 19% after it is lifted. Thus, the pandemic was a good opportunity for Japanese corporation to introduce teleworking, but there were some technical obstacles and a deeper problems of office culture. Moreover, there are significant differences due to firm size, employment status, and location. Larger firms are better prepared to roll out teleworking. Non-regular workers are often excluded from this option, while 38% of Tokyo employees are using teleworking. Please look at the slide four. This slide shows the proportion of workplace introducing teleworking due to COVID-19 by sex and employment status. 25.3% of male regular workers responded that teleworking was introduced in their workplaces when the outbreak ramps up, while the same figure for female regular workers was 18.8%. Looking at the figures for workplaces where non-regular workers are clustered, very few places adopted teleworking except for temporary agency workers. Teleworking differ greatly by firm size as well. The slide five shows the results for firms hired more than 3,000 employees 44.1% of male workers and 28% of female workers responded that their companies adopted teleworking, while only 5.3% of firms employing less than 30 employees adopted teleworking, primarily because they lack resources to do so. Thus, Teleworking has mostly been restricted to larger firms and regular workers. Non-regular workers are disproportionately women, thus the extent to which they are excluded from teleworking reinforces existing gender disparities. So far, I have discussed how the COVID-19 outbreak had a disproportionately negative impact on women and non-regular workers. However, the pandemic is also instigating some social changes as well. Due to teleworking, some corporations are modifying corporate culture, such as abolishing the practice of rotating workers to distant offices, a practice that makes it difficult for women to balance work and family responsibilities. As technological and cyber security hurdles are overcome, the spread of teleworking holds the potential for enhancing household work-life balance and might encourage couples to have more children. It is also reported that 40% of women responded that household chores are increasing, while only 20% of men responded similarly, suggesting that at home work, most of the work is shifted uh, on women. At the same time, 40% of respondents welcomed increased hours to spend time with family due to teleworking, 
This number is even higher if we restrict the sample to males only. Introducing teleworking is making Japanese family realize what has been sacrificed due to long working hours and the uh, long commuting hours as well. Another interesting development is the decline of the population in metropolitan areas. For teleworkers, larger, more affordable living spaces outside city centers are now a viable option. And the ongoing paradigm shift of work and office focus lift to one more amenable to work-life balance will take some time, but it appears that Japan is at a turning point. The key will be to reduce teleworking inequalities so that more workers can enjoy the benefits. Firms are awakening to the potential for enhancing productivity and cutting fixed centralized office costs, but one can expect resistance to change will slow the transformation. And the next speaker will be Bridget. And Bridget, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your stories. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fukuda and uh, Dr. Osawa. Um, so my name is Bridget Schulte. I'm a writer and journalist, and I'm the director of the Better Life Lab at New America. And I know we're talking about work-family balance uh, in the age of COVID, but I think it's really important to talk about work-family justice, uh, because what we're talking about is, uh, if you look at all sorts of different indicators, um, we are really looking at women in particular being set back at least a generation. And so what I wanna do is start with an understanding of uh, the situation before COVID so that we have a really good understanding of why COVID really matters. And so first I wanna talk about the fact that women have been uh, uh, entering the labor market really since the 1970s for two reasons. And one in the United States, the women's movement opened up opportunities and possibilities for women. Uh, but the other, we, we have to understand that wages began to stagnate uh, there was no longer a, a family wage, which was really an artifact of the uh, after the Second World War, where you could have one uh, wage that supported an entire family. And so you needed two wages to be able to, to, uh, to maintain the same uh, standard of living. I think that's an important thing to remember, that research has shown that if women had not entered the labor force in the 1970s en masse, many more families would have fallen into poverty. The other thing I want people to notice is that uh, the idea that women working in the marketplace was a new phenomenon, it really wasn't. In the United States, uh, in particular, African-American women uh, were uh, primary breadwinners and, and literally always uh, worked. So, so this is an important thing to remember. Um, uh, so that as women entered the work workforce, even mothers of infants entered the workforce in, in high numbers. And here you see it. Um, you know, looking at it uh, by various racial and ethnic groups. Um, what's really important also is to, as women entered uh, the workforce, uh, what did not change for them is they were still expected to be primary caregivers. And if you look even before COVID, um, women are taking on the bulk of the family and home responsibilities. If you look at time diary data, Women uh, before COVID were, give, were spending at least two, sometimes three times the amount of time that men were on childcare and housework. And that has just exploded during COVID. Uh, so before COVID, it's important to note through the last few decades, women's lives changed entirely, uh, combining work and uh, paid work as well as uh, the, the unpaid work of, in house and home. And men's lives really did not change that much. Uh, uh, there's been a slight increase in housework. There's been a, uh, more of an increase in um, childcare, but it pales in comparison to what uh, the increases in, in women. And part of this, I'm going to get talking about policy, but I think it's also to, important to talk about cultural and cultural expectations, particularly for majority white culture. We have this ideal worker culture. Um, 
uh, uh, both our previous speakers talked about long overwork cultures. We also have an overwork culture in the United States where we uh, value and reward long work hours. Uh, we think the ideal worker, as surveys have shown, that we think that the ideal worker is someone with no caregiving responsibilities, which really cuts women out from the start. We also have these notions of an ideal mother that uh, just as the ideal worker is fully available all, always and everywhere for work, an ideal mother is fully available at all times for her children. And this affects women even if you are not a mother because this is a very strong cultural, uh, st strong cultural norm that this is what women should be and should be doing. Uh, and you see this uh, show out, you know, it plays out not only in overt discrimination, which still exists as we see in the Me Too movement, but also in very strong unconscious bias. These are some implicit uh, project implicit tests. And you can see this sort of this automatic association uh, that men are breadwinners with career, women are caregivers uh, with family. Um, you know, so why this is important, if you look at education, women began graduating from college in greater numbers than men in 1985. So you would think that that would translate then into women in more positions of power and leadership, and that has not been the case. Uh, this, we have a very gendered leadership gap that really hasn't budged much uh, in, in the last decades, despite um, more attention to it or women's uh, efforts in corporate America, it really hasn't made much of a difference. When you look at the uh, at pay, you can see that a lot of the pay gap is really a uh, what they call the maternal wall. It's really it's it's less between childless men and women, and far more between mothers and fathers. That when men become fathers, the research shows they get a bonus because uh, uh, because the thinking is they will become um, more um, dedicated providers. Uh, whereas women are, are uh, they take a, a hit on their income because they're expected to then uh, pay more attention to home and caregiving, whether this is true or not. Uh, and so uh, this is important to remember that it's actually exacerbated across uh, race. So there's not only a gender wage gap, there's also a uh, race wage gap uh, that is particularly pronounced for African-American and Hispanic uh, women. And not only, the, you know, not only does that uh, uh, income gap uh, have huge consequences, it, it also contributes to uh, a, um, a wealth gap. So uh, when I talked earlier about time, you can see here in, in terms of time, women spend far more time at the purple, the care work, uh, about twice the amount of uh, time that men do. So that they are, if you look at the red, they're, uh, they're less able to spend time on kind of concentrated work that can get you ahead. We also have overwork and because of those care responsibilities, women are far less able to uh, put in those overwork hours that end up being rewarded. When you look at where women are and why women have been so impacted by COVID, they tend to be in female dominated and low wage sectors. Um, you know, even though, despite the fact that women have become more breadwinning, uh, you know, they are co-breadwinners in 41% of the families, um, there has been really no substan substantive family supportive policy support. We are one of the few countries that does not have a paid parental leave. We have no paid sick days. We have no paid vacation leave. Uh, family is considered a very private affair, have no help, no real, virtually no help with childcare. So you can see the weekly costs of childcare have skyrocketed, median earnings have not. And meanwhile, caregivers themselves, the paid caregivers earn poverty wages. So it's a system that really does not work for anyone. Largely because uh, in the uh, early 1970s, there was an effort to have universal childcare and it was defeated by Pat Buchanan and others from the, the rising right wing of the Republican Party who uh, associated childcare with communism. This was at the height of the Cold War. And that legacy has really uh, carried over into family policy in the United States. And now we enter the brave new world of COVID. Uh, now we've all become the BBC dad as we work in our homes, uh, if we're able to. But this is important to remember that work, that, re that remote work has become a marker for class, uh, that many uh, essential workers cannot work remotely. Um, uh, and this is important to remember that the majority of children are being raised by parents where all parents work, 
Uh, the women's second shift has gotten longer, particularly with homeschooling. Uh, there's a real childcare crisis with centers closing and without support. And there has been no large national response. Uh, fully 80% of uh, childcare providers expect to go out of business by next June. Uh, as we've seen in the unemployment uh, uh, figures, there's been a huge impact again across race uh, and gender, but really in the last month, a million people dropped out of the workforce, 80% of them were women. So as the historian Patrick Wyman has said, crises like these reveal what is already broken or in the process of breaking. And we are at a real inflection point where we have an opportunity to really uh, learn from the past and, uh, and create a, a better new normal with better policies, better practices at work and, uh, and a, a renewed sense of equity and culture. So I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to the discussion. All right, well, thank you very much for those very informative and thought provoking remarks. Um, let's see, so before we open things up to the audience and we've already got some great questions in the queue that I look forward to that discussion, I'd like to engage the panelists in just a brief, brief discussion of our own uh, my first question for the panel is specifically about this issue of, of telework, um, which has been a major COVID countermeasure embraced by governments, businesses, and the education sector. Now, as your presentations made clear, however, not all jobs or careers or even individuals have equal access to remote work or online learning as a viable option. Can I ask each of you to say just a bit more about the limits of telework and perhaps more importantly, the differential effects across various socioeconomic and other divides in your country. And if I could, I'd just like to go in the following order. Um, Bridget, if you could start us off and then Osawa-san and Fukuda-san, thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for the, for the question and thank you for this discussion. I think two things. I think that just as uh, Dr. Osawa said, with this remote work, uh, it's really opened up possibility. There was a lot of resistance to remote work prior to the, uh, to the pandemic. A number of firms said it's not possible, we can't do it. And really overnight, they showed that you can, you can do it in very trying circumstances um, when people are, uh, life is turned upside down and they're giving care. And the productivity figures have shown people have been able to perform under enormous, uh, enormously difficult circumstances. That said, on the flip side, I think we're beginning to see essential workers can't work remotely. Uh, these are people who are low, poorly paid, they have no benefits, they were exempted from emergency paid leave and paid sick days legislation. And so what we really need to be thinking about is what are the policies that we need to support uh, essential workers that, that are not able to work remotely, definitely with paid sick days, uh, paid family leave, uh, looking at flexibility in terms of schedule control. We, we, we think of flexibility, a lot of uh, poorer workers who cannot work remotely have crazy schedules, completely unpredictable. They have no control over them. So that is actually one good way to think about flexibility as really giving people control over the time, manner, and place that they work in, uh, in the manner that is um, possible in the kind of work that they do. Thank you, Dr. Osawa. Yes, uh, yeah. I just want to briefly uh, summarize what I said about the teleworking is actually increasing disparity at the workplace and then also gender inequality, gen gender gap, increase the gender gap uh, because the uh, uh, most of the teleworking is introduced to uh, professional workers and managerial workers and then also full-time workers, male full-time workers. So the, the, uh, more, more than half of the women workers are working as non-regular. So as a result, uh, women are excluded uh, mostly from this opportunity. So uh, we have to think much more evenly yeah, as a sort of a, a increasing the opportunity for uh, you know women to participate in teleworking. Thank you, Dr. Fukuda. Thank you. Yes, um, I think that widening economic inequality during the COVID-19 pandemic is a world phenomenon, not a particular problem for the U.S. and Japan. And whether people can work from home or not is one major source of the divide. Whether people can use telework or not really depend on industry, occupation, type of employment, company size, et cetera, as uh, the, uh, Professor Osawa and Bridget just shown. 
And studies show that those who are less educated, less income, and women rather than men are more likely to be negatively affected by the pandemic due partly to working in non-teleworking types of jobs. This divide possibly enlarges in the future as those who can use telework can be more productive than those who cannot. Also, when it comes to the limits of telework, studies show that women tend to increase their time for caregiving and housework if working from home. So even if telework is possible for both men and women, gender inequality at home may be more intensified during the stay at home period than it is in usual times. Great, thank, thank you. you very much. And so one of the issues that this raises, telework is just one of many issue areas where we rely on policymakers to change policies to adjust to these new circumstances, especially um, under COVID-19 conditions. And so my second question for the panel is about policy priorities. So as all of your presentations made clear, COVID-19 has really exposed many major issues related to work-life balance in both the US and Japan. So I'd like to ask each of you to please share with our audience, what do you think your government's number one policy priority should be in order to begin to address these outstanding challenges in 2021? And for this, I'd like to go in the following order, uh, Dr. Osawa, Dr. Yeah. Fukuda, and then we'll wrap up with Bridget. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's. I think many uh, speakers the, uh, mentioned the work-life balance is sort of elusive in Japan, because the uh, uh, still the very strong uh, patriarchal uh, patriarchal uh, corporate culture. So the uh, uh, that we have to break through that. Uh, the sort of uh, division of labor, the, uh, the strong uh, social norm, uh, which is embedded into the uh, corporate culture, uh, and then also that the uh, taxation and social social security policies is combined together, uh, sort of incentivize the uh, women marginalized in, in the workplace, so that uh, we have to introduce the uh, gender neutral social security policy. And the, uh, also uh, uh, we have to introduce uh, much more family friendly uh, corporate employment practices. So that's what we found just through the experience of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, what has to be done to achieve the uh, uh, work-life balance uh, society. Fukuda san thank you. Yes, um, I fully agree with uh, uh, what uh, Professor Osawa mentioned. So far, the Japanese government's first policy priority is economic policies to make the business run. Um, one of the symbolic one is the go to travel campaign, which subsidizes 50% of expenses for domestic travel, and everyone can use this campaign. The purpose of this campaign is to help travel industries and to local economies. Uh, this policy obviously put more priority on economies and su suppressing the virus. So there are so many other subsidies and benefits for various use too. Um, but so I think that these subsidies and benefits are never enough for those who actually lost their jobs or business. Uh, but still the government spends an enormous amount of money to counter with the COVID-19 and almost all these extra spending is uh, procured by national security bonds or in other words, debt to the future generations. Uh, so that makes me a little worry as Japan has been accumulating huge public debt due to the rapidly increasing social security expenditure already. Uh, so although this uh, extra expenditure for uh, helping uh, uh, and kind of uh, uh, helping the COVID-19 pandemic is important and necessary, but uh, uh, I still a little bit worry about the future debt issues. Thank you. And Bridget, what about the United States? What would you advise the, the government to, to prioritize next year or sooner? Yeah, well, I think that we need to think on three levels. We need to do we do need to think about public policy, the government role. 
We need to think about practice. Uh, you know, uh, as the other speakers have mentioned, corporate culture, workplace practice is enormously powerful. We need to be thinking about how to reset that. We also need to think about culture and culture change. So what the government can do immediately, no doubt about it, the first thing they should do is bail out the childcare industry. You know, at the, in the spring, when, uh, when everything started to shut down uh, and Congress passed a $2 trillion CARES Act, they had $3 billion for, uh, for helping childcare, which is a drop in the bucket. Uh, Delta Airlines got more than that. Uh, advocates have been pushing for $50 billion since then, and it's gotten no traction in Congress. So the first thing to do is really shore up child care because that is a, it's on fire. It's really hurting families and particularly women. And then we need to look for long-term solutions about how to build care infrastructure throughout our lives. Because not only do we have a child care crisis, we have a coming elder care crisis. And we really, we do not value care in this country. So we need to be thinking how do we elevate the value of paid and unpaid care? We need paid family and medical leave. We need paid sick days. We need to join the other developed nations in having uh, family supportive policies. It is ridiculous and cruel that we do not. It's insane, frankly, it's crazy. So there, there are a number of things that the government can do. Uh, what corporations can do, uh, you know, they only pay to one to 4% of the cost of childcare they can either begin to offer more uh, family supportive policies or they can support uh, larger national uh, efforts. You've got small businesses who are behind uh, national policies because they are not able to compete with larger companies on a private basis. And so uh, having national guarantees actually helps them level the playing field. And so uh, kind of marrying the, uh, the, the competitive productive aspect with the, the larger collective good I think is a really important thing to do. And, and finally, on culture, recognize that the world has changed, that we have a very dynamic multicultural uh, society, uh, and that, uh, that so many of the policies are not only stuck in the past, they're stuck in kind of like a white reality from the 1950s that really doesn't serve anyone and is not how anyone lives anymore. And so uh, really using this as an inflection point to move forward and make policies that are real for real people. Great, thank you. Well, we'd now like to open things up to the audience and we have a very long list of questions. Apologies in advance if due to time, we, we don't have an opportunity to get to your uh, specific question, but looks like the first question in the queue is from um, Dr. Hilly Holbrow, who is, teaches at Harvard and will soon be joining me at Indiana University as my new colleague in January. Um, and Dr. Holbrow asks, my question is for Osawa Sensei. It is very interesting that there are such big differences between men and women's likelihood of teleworking, even mm -hmm. among firms with the same number of employees. Yeah. Do you interpret this as primarily a difference between firms, meaning that men and women are employed in different types of firms, or a difference within firms, meaning men and women are doing different types of jobs at the same firm? Well, I think it's it just the both the uh, in the uh, even with the uh, uh, sort of the yeah the same company that the, the uh, women are doing the uh, uh, different jobs. So the mo many men are doing the managerial jobs or uh, sort of like uh, maybe the jobs that the. Uh, able to choose their own time and places. On the other hand, women are supporting uh, staff, so they were not able to uh, work, uh, uh, able to choose the workplace and the hours. So that would be one of the reasons why within the uh, a corporation within the corporation, and then I think that the across the firm that smaller businesses do not have uh, uh, enough uh, the uh, uh, equipment to uh, be able to adapt the uh, teleworking. So I think that two different issues are combined in this data. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Regis Arno, and I'd like to direct this question to both Bridget and Fukuda-san. So. Womenomics are always presented as goals to solve a labor shortage problem. It's never seen as a benefit for women themselves. Can work-life balance be achieved if women's direct interest is neglected? And a follow-up question as well. Um, freedom of women is also never mentioned in womenomics. Isn't that a fundamental flaw of such policy? 
um, and maybe start with Bridget, if that's okay, and then Fukuda-san. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let Dr. Fukuda, uh, you know, respond specifically to womenomics, but I'll respond to the larger question. It, you know, and the fascinating thing is when you look at other work supportive or family supportive or gender equity programs, you know, we, we tout the Scandinavian countries or some of the European countries. And if you look, those policies were initially uh, passed uh, because of labor shortages, uh, labor shortages, say in Sweden, or because of fears, uh, uh, you know, needing to uh, repopulate after devastating world wars in Germany and France. Uh, what happened over time is those policies kind of uh, reinforced traditional gender roles. You had very long maternity leaves, but then that didn't translate into gender equity. Uh, so what ended up happening is that many firms wouldn't even hire young women for fear that they would need to send them out on maternity leave for, for long leave. So you have, say, in Sweden, a lot of occupational segregation where women uh, were kind of like shunted into the pr public sector rather than the private sector. They worked shorter hours. So what happened is then when, when it became more important to, as the, as the questioner asked, to kind of center women and gender equity, there was sort of a big rethink and recognizing you cannot support women's equity in the public sphere without looking at men and men's equity in the private sphere, you know, bringing men into more of the caregiving role. So that's when you started seeing uh, policies that created, uh, you know, father quotas or, or uh, entitlements for men, and that if the men didn't use them, then the family lost that time. Well, what ended up happening is take up rates went off the charts. Um, you know, up into the 80s and 90%. And then because men had more of that exposure, culture changed. And then it became much more of a norm for a good father to have time with his family rather than just be that distant provider. So that's an example of how a policy can actually lead to culture shift, uh, you know, kind of like that slow movement of, of kind of learning by doing and learning from mistakes along the way. Thank you. Fukuda-san? Yes, so um, I mentioned that on top of everything, the major policy in, uh, motivation for uh, women mix is uh, pressure from the population decline. But what I mean by uh, on top of everything, that's, that uh, include uh, well-being of working mothers, of course. So there has been, the thing is that there has been long discussions about uh, work-life balance issues to uh, kind of help uh, increase the well-being of working mothers, but the policy response was rather slow in the past. But when uh, Abe came into power, and then uh, when he started the uh, women mix, the situation Japan was already facing to the population decline. So what I mean is the policy motivation to cope with the population decline and also to support working mother uh, kind of really matched. So in a sense, uh, so the, the to help well-being of working mother and to cope with population decline, the, maybe the motivation may be slightly different, the, but the goal became kind of the same. So that is really happened uh, during the time of the women mix. That's what I mean by the policy motivation. Great, thank you very much. So our next question is about smaller companies and how they're responding. And it comes from Gabriel Rebic. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing any of these names here. Um, so he writes that it was mentioned that some smaller companies have been unable to adapt to telework due to a lack of resources. Often the thinking is that if workers do their best, they can help generate the resources to bring more solutions to their company. In reality, this thinking leads directly to the kind of overwork we are discussing. What can be done to help workers in these smaller companies that lack of, resource, lack of resources for healthy work environments? And I'd like um, Osawa-san and Bridget, if you could please respond to this question. Yeah, I, I'm not really, uh, maybe the not right person, but I think it is uh, very good to uh, give them the uh, tools to, you know, sort of providing the uh, uh, tools to introduce the teleworking, because I think once you are able to use it, uh, uh, you adapt it. So in Japan for so long that the uh, face uh, 
culture, the, the sort of the the business culture, the face to face is very common. So that everybody thinks that the、uh, teleworking is not working. So this is the first time that the Japan adopted the new technology. So that the、uh, the small like. Cooperation has not been adapted, but、uh, since we were able to do that very quickly, that we were able to use the Zoom and Teams and、uh, younger、uh, workers, especially adapting those new technologies very quickly. So I think that the、uh, this will be the、uh, the beginning that the J- Japanese business、uh, learn the、uh, benefit of、uh, introducing teleworking and especially and young. Younger workers、uh, in, interested in、uh, want to spend more time with family. So I think the、uh, we will see in the future, but the uh,、um, many uh, changes w- will ch- take place in the future. I think,、uh, and the government is working、uh, should work introduce those uh, uh, s- solving security issues and something like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bridget. Yeah, and I would just address the overwork. Portion of that question,、mm-hmm. and I would say that overwork is not solely an experience that small companies face. If you look at work hours in the United States, overwork is a ubiquitous phenomenon, no matter what size of company you work in. In white collar companies, you've got、uh, you know a kind of、uh, we work some uh, uh, among some of the longest and most irregular hours. And then on the other side of the socioeconomic spectrum, you've got work that doesn't pay enough, and so people are kind of cobbling together different jobs. So you've got overwork and stress in a very different fashion. But you've got overwork and stress,、uh, you know,、uh, throughout the labor market. And so to, to the question of small companies,、um, you know, I have not seen data that shows that they have not transferred to remote work as much as、uh, larger companies. Uh, there's a lot that we're still、uh, trying to、uh, understand and, and find out. A number of smaller firms have, but I think what's really important to remember on the overwork question is that the research shows before COVID, if you worked at home or re- worked remotely, you tended to work longer hours than your colleagues in the office. And part of that is they call it gift theory because when we Prioritize people in、uh, kind of in a FaceTime or a presence culture. If you're not doing that, you feel like, oh, I need to really work hard. I need to make up for this.、Um, that said, in this COVID situation, the research shows that everyone is now working longer, as much as three more hours a day. So everyone is under stress. No one is. There's this blur between work and life. So what needs to happen is much stronger leadership and management. Uh, recognizing that your your people your are you know your human capital is really the strength of your firm your organization you know whatever your nonprofit and so you really need to protect people from burnout and that means creating a strong sense of priorities good communication、uh, revamping how performance metrics are are、um, are done during the the pandemic there are a number of management. Uh, tools that companies can and should be using right now to help people weather this, because overwork is ubiquitous and it's become、uh, much more intense during COVID. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm afraid that we're approaching the end of our time.、Um, before I turn things over to Ron Casimir for some closing remarks, I'd just like to thank all of you, thank our panelists. For their extremely valuable contributions to this important discussion,、um, and to our global audience for joining us. Thanks for your great questions. This has been a fascinating discussion, and you've given us all, including hopefully our policymakers, business leaders, and civil society leaders, a lot to think about. So before we sign off,、uh, Ron Casimir, Vice President of Programs for the Social Science Research Council, would just like to say a few words. Ron, over to you. Thank you, Adelman. What an extraordinary discussion! Thanks to all the panelists,、um, who are all Abe fellows, and、um, truly, uh, uh, no better way to showcase the incredible work that the program supports、um, than uh, listening to these、um, uh, incredible scholars and journalists、uh, talk about their work on a, an issue for which the stakes couldn't be higher.、Um, I'm really here to say thank yous. Uh, thank you、uh, again to the panelists and to the moderator, Adam. Amazing job.、Uh, 
Uh, also, thank you to our partners for this event. Um, this includes New America's Better Life Lab and Indiana University's 21st Century uh, Japan Politics and Society Initiative. Um, and thanks to Bridget um, and to Adam for bringing us all together. Most especially in terms of partnership, I'd like to thank Suka Hiroko and her colleagues at the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership for their support and a collaboration with the Social Science Research Council. Uh, this is now a 29 year old program, the Abe Fellowship Program, which SSRC has organized with the CGP. Um, and it's in, uh, it, that includes now a, a few years old, the Abe Global Forum, uh, which is intended to bring the knowledge and insights of our fellows to a broader audience. And I think you um, saw how, uh, how um, persuasive that was today. I'd also like to add my thanks to the um, SSRC's Abe team for all their work in pulling this off. Uh, there's no time to give you any details. I, we're just about out of time. But I did want to uh, encourage you to visit the SSRC's COVID-19 and Social Sciences Virtual Research Center, in which, for which the theme of today is extraordinarily relevant. Um, much of the work featured on this site um, focuses on how our extraordinary situation and experience of the moment has been shaped by and affected and will affect um, deeply rooted social and political dynamics, whether entrenched racial, economic, or gender inequality, the proliferation of misinformation, and anxieties about the ability of, world, of the world's democracies to confront major crises and problems. Uh, by the way, forthcoming on this site will be an essay forum on COVID in Asia, so stay tuned for that. In closing, let me again repeat my thanks for the extraordinary quality of the conversation today on something that really matters for all of us. Uh, genuine appreciation to our panelists and partners and really great questions from the audience. Um, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you. Thanks. <laughs>